Uh, I think um, our speakers today are very qualified to talk about this. Our first speaker today, I think you're really going to like him. His name is Robert Beebe. He's currently principal of the New Hope School, a non-sectarian private school in Clifton, New Jersey, and chairman of the board of Gen A Inc., the school's parent organization. He is also vice president of curriculum development with the International Education Foundation, which promotes character <coughs> education around the globe. He spent 13 years in Russia with IEF, where he was instrumental in introducing My World and I, IEF's character education curriculum to thousands of schools across the former USSR. In this capacity, he traveled to all but one of the former Soviet republics and dozens of countries worldwide conducting seminars to introduce IEF's work to education ministries and departments as well as individual schools. Mr. Beebe is editor of the English edition of the curriculum entitled My Journey in Life and co-wrote Universal Peace Federation Character Education Series, Discovering the Real Me. In, in, addition, in addition, he is the author of a number of PowerPoint presentations on topics concerning education as well as a lecture, God or No God, The Great Debate, which has been presented at a number of UPF programs as well as UC Leadership Program at Learning Center in New York City. He's a graduate of Princeton University. Mr. Beebe is married and the father of six children. He's currently working towards a doctorate in education with Walden University. Let's welcome him. Thank you. Thank you for coming out this Saturday morning. I think Saturday is difficult for some people. Uh, this first presentation uh, is entitled, as you see, Principles of Creation. And uh, we know that when we look at the universe, that uh, there are, of course, many uh, natural laws that in existence uh, on an external level. We know that there's a law of gravity and there's the laws of thermodynamics and other things that keep the universe uh, uh, moving and uh, operating in a very harmonious fac uh, fashion. So we know that th this as a, a scientist, discover that these things exist. Uh, but it really asks the question, you know, where do these laws come from? Where do these uh, basic principles come from? So many scientists uh, may not ask that kind of question. They, they uh, admit the existence of such laws and principles, but don't go to the point of really s trying to understand the origin of these things. So when we talk about origin, Let's see if this works, okay. We're talking, of course, about God. Uh, and uh, we live in a world today where people have many different ideas about God or even whether God exists at all. There's, uh, over the past uh, decade or so, a couple decades, there's been a growing movement uh, questioning the existence of God and people like Richard Dawkins and Christopher uh, Hitchens and others really uh, presenting an argument for some people very powerful that there is no God. And certainly when you look at the world today, you might question, well, <laughs> okay, God, if you exist, where are you? What are you doing? Because uh, there seems to be so many problems around us and all throughout history. So this is a very important question for us to uh, address uh, because it will determine our outlook, our worldview, about our own lives and about the world and about history and where we should be going. Also, when we talk about God, it's, it's an issue of not a question of whether there's a creator or not, but also whether there's a more moral order to our universe. Are we, is, is there some kind of, uh, as there are natural laws governing the physical universe, are there some sort of moral or spiritual laws that are governing uh, the non-physical aspects of reality? And is there a non-physical physical aspects to reality? As Dostoevsky said, uh, for, if there's, there's not, for if there's no everlasting God, there's no such thing as virtue. Without God, uh, you know, is there right or wrong? Such a thing as right or wrong? 
Are there absolute moral laws that govern human behavior? Or is everything simply a matter of individual preference? So this, these questions have great implications for, for life. And uh, many of the things that are, are taking place today here in America and throughout the world involve this kind of fundamental question. So when we look at things like, you know, the uh, federal government basically forcing Catholic institutions to uh, provide contraceptive health coverage to employees, it's, it's infringing upon certain religious beliefs, or religious values that many people hold uh, very dear to them. You know, that uh, sexual, sexual relationships outside of marriage are wrong. And we should not be encouraging or supporting that kind of thing. Or the whole issue of uh, homosexuality and gay rights, gay marriage, uh, which are being promoted very much in many sectors today. And now apparently our president also is really on board to promote such things. Uh, this also comes up against uh, fundamental religious beliefs of many people that homosexuality is wrong and the, the Bible itself indicates clearly in many places about this. So, but, so we, we see here these kinds of things are taking place where to people of different world views, some who are saying that it's a matter of just my individual preference, others are saying, well, there's, a, a, there's an issue of morality involved here. There are certain moral principles that we should stand by. So we are in the midst of a great debate today uh, here in America and throughout the world as to which direction we're going to be taking. And the fact is that you know, religions have always been, with, have been concerned with very fundamental questions about the universe and about life. You know, why is there a universe in the first place? Uh, why do the laws of nature exist? What is the meaning of human existence? Uh, what is the purpose of life? Is there such things as right or wrong? And uh, why is there suffering in the world? So if we could have answers to these questions, as Virgil said, uh, happy is he who gets to know the reasons for things. So many people are not happy in the world. Many people are confused and struggling and suffering in many different ways, not just because of perhaps their material or their physical situation, but because they're confused, they do not understand the purpose of life. And what, what, should, what should we do with our lives in our short time that we're here on this earth? Uh, so religions have always sought to address, address these kinds of issues. Governments and civilizations may come and go, but religions, our world religions, remain for thousands of years. So they should not be belittled or thrown away because of some of the latest fashion. So of course, religion fundamentally, one of its big questions is, involves the nature of God. What is God life like? What is God's nature? And so when we talk about principles of creation, we want to look in, at the nature of God. Uh, who is God and what is God doing? Why did God create in the first place? So I'm going to here now go into some fancy slides. I hope that they work. <laughs> um, high technology sometimes has its disadvantages too. Uh, everything that human beings create is created for a purpose. Uh, a car, a uh, fishing rod exists for a certain purpose and they have their value by fulfilling that purpose. Uh, we would not use a fishing rod to uh, try to catch a bear with, for example. It won't work. Uh, so by, by fulfilling the purpose, then these kinds of things have values. So we can apply this question to ourselves. What is our purpose? If we don't understand our purpose, then we will not realize our value or perhaps even we will not feel our value 
very deeply. We may feel that we have no value. So it's very important for us to understand what is our purpose as human beings. Okay. So in answering this question, we have to look at, we have, we're asking the question, you know, why did God create us? What is our purpose of, in creation? And to answer this question, we have to also look at the design by which God uh, created us and by which things operate. So I want to talk about three fundamental aspects to God's design that we see when we look at all aspects of creation. First of all, that things are created in complementary pairs. Okay, moving. So if we look at every level, starting from atoms to molecules to plants to animals to people, we see certain fundamental uh, characteristics on every level that is universal and will give us insights into uh, the design of God's creation. So one of the things that we discover is that everything is created in uh, complementary pairs. Uh, in, the, in the living world, there is a masculinity and femininity to everything that come together and bring about new creation. On the molecular or atomic level, we see positivity and negativity, this kind of complementarity exists. Also, there's another type of complementarity in terms of internal and external. Uh, we see the external, the physical appearance of things, but within those physical things, there's some sort of internal nature to them. So we th see this clearly, of course, in animals. Animals have many different types of natures, uh, even within certain species. For example, dogs, if you have, if you have a dog, there are some very nice, quiet dogs. Uh, non-aggressive, but others that are quite aggressive. Um, so we see in the animal world, in the plant world as well, uh, there are, everything has a certain, operating according to, to, to a certain kind of internal nature. So we can ask the question for ourselves too. Uh, we have also an internal nature. We see ourselves externally, external appearance, but we are not just our bodies, we are also, uh, we have a, an internal aspect to ourselves, uh, which makes us unique human beings. Everybody has a different personality, a different uh, character. There are no two people alike. I have uh, twin sons, but they are completely different. <laughs> they may look very similar to each other, but their, their personality and their character is very different from each other. Uh, so it's, in one sense, it's uh, comforting to know there's never been another person like you. Uh, not only today, but throughout history. There's never been and there never will be a person like you. We are all created unique. And so another insight that we, when we look at the, the world around us is that there are dual purposes to everything. So on the one hand, we, have, we are responsible to take care of ourselves. Uh, we have to, we're responsible to get up in the morning to, and take care of our physical bodies, our physical needs, perhaps eat some breakfast, dress ourselves, get ready to go out and take care of ourselves. But the purpose of our life is not just to do that, to take care of ourselves. We do this in order to go out and make a contribution to the world around us. So everything, exists with a, an individual purpose to it, as well as a whole purpose. Um, so we exist to make an imprint on the world. We find our ultimate happiness and joy and fulfillment by doing something that will make an impact on others, hopefully a good impact. So there's a kind of a, give and take action taking place here, a, a, a uh, ongoing harmony exists between ourselves and the world around us when we live for this higher purpose. Uh, when we live selfishly, simply focus on ourselves, then we kind of cut into this harmonious give and take that should be taking place between ourselves and others. 
ultimate happiness then comes by not simply taking care of ourselves, but also living for a higher purpose and taking care of the world around us and making a contribution to that. So there should be a balance between taking care of our own needs and taking care of the higher needs of the world around us. Another uh, insight that we discover when we look at uh, the world around us, especially the, the living world, is that everything is involved with a growth process. Everything takes time to grow and develop. Um, we live in a world in America, America is very fond of its uh, kind of uh, fast food culture and uh, instant gratification. Uh, we, people are, want to be stimulated and get some results right away. But this goes against a basic uh, principle of the universe that Everything takes time to grow and develop to reach its ultimate potential. And uh, you know, farmers, of course, certainly know this. If you plant your seeds in the springtime, you can't expect to have uh, your crop of corn or whatever the next week. It's going to take uh, several weeks or months to, before you can finally harvest your crops. So uh, the result comes only after a time of investment. So this takes place in nature, it also takes place in many aspects of, of human um, activity as well. If you want to grow a business, you, you know, today's uh, multinational corporations almost all started off in some small place, maybe uh, somebody's garage sometime or someplace else in a very small manner, but then over time, over years, it grew and developed and became the uh, great corporation that may, exi may exist today. The same thing is true with love as well. Uh, we live in a culture that emphasizes falling in love and uh, like instantaneous this experience of uh, romantic love that people want to have. But real love, lasting love, takes time to grow and develop. So anybody who has a lasting marriage and a successful marriage knows this, that uh, it's not something that just happened overnight. But after 20, 30, 40 years, finally you realize how deeply you love your spouse. And uh, successful couples finally become even more beautiful as time goes on, even though their skin may be sagging. And externally, they don't look so great anymore. But in terms of their heart and their love for each other, it's, uh, it's grown and become a great uh, blossom. So, if you want to create a work of art or a piece of music, uh, also it's, it's a process of time that takes uh, perhaps days or weeks or months to do. So this is a, very, a fundamental uh, principle of creation, that things take time to grow and develop. Everybody has a certain potential, which we, we may or may not realize. But to get from where I am now, to realize a potential also takes time, takes uh, time. So, and to fulfill that potential for human beings, there's uh, the added aspect of responsibility, that we can only get there by fulfilling our responsibility through the choices that we make. So if we make good choices, if we make responsible choices, we can see ourselves going forward and going towards our goal to, to, to fulfill, to reach our full potential. If we make bad choices, if we're living simply for our own gratification or instant fulfillment, then we'll never get there. We'll never fulfill, uh, reach our potential. So for human growth, it's not something that's automatic. It may be automatic in terms of our bodies, the physical aspects, just as it is with trees and animals and other living things. The growth takes place in more or less automatic fashion. But in terms of our, we may call our spiritual growth, or our moral development is something that depends very much upon the responsible choices that we make day by day. So these three aspects of God's design, they, they form a fundamental, uh, describe a fundamental aspect of reality. Through complementary pairs, then we find two becoming one. In the animal world and the human world, as well. Uh, through dual purposes, we, we learn that uh, we don't simply take care of ourselves, my own self-purpose, but I should make 
and unique imprint or impact on the world around me, the living for the whole purpose. And the growth process takes place again in human life through our personal efforts. So once we understand these three aspects of God's design, this can also lead us to an insight into the nature of God, as we started off talking about, uh, what God's heart is like. Why did God create? What was God's heart behind that? Well, it turns out that God himself also wants to be in relationship with us. Every, there's relationships every, everywhere. We can define existence as based, everything is based upon relationships. And God, too, of course, wants to be very much involved in his creation and form a partnership, especially with us, as which we're going to talk about as his children. So if you look at, in terms of relationship, what is the deepest relationship in, in human life? I think we can say that the, the deepest, most fundamental kind of relationship, most profound relationship, is the relationship between the parent and child. Parents who really love their children will do anything for the sake of their children. They're ready to sacrifice anything so that the children will be happy and successful in their lives. It's a relationship that can never be broken. It's an eternal relationship. Your children will always be your children. And uh, we will all, our parents will always be our parents, no matter how old we become. So Reverend Moon is fond of saying, even when you're 70 years old and your, your father's 90, you know, he's still your daddy, even though you may be a grandfather father to someone else. But is that, that relationship is still there no matter what age it is. And it is meant to be the first love relationship that we experience in life. The first love that we should experience should be the, that receiving love from our own parents. So this relationship is the most fundamental relationship in, uh, in human life. So God is seeking to become our partner through this kind of relationship where we become one with each other. So as Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Jesus was a person who fulfilled this where God could dwell directly with him. But actually this is God's ideal for all of us. God desires to dwell in each one of us, not just in Jesus, uh, but every one of us is meant to become God's children and have this, this deep abiding relationship with him in our daily lives, that we can communicate with God uh, in a very intimate way uh, on an ongoing basis. So again, God's design tells us that everything is in relationship, everything has a higher purpose. We are meant to live not just for ourselves, but for a higher purpose. Everything grows and develops over time, and that God's heart is that he longs to, for a partner with whom he can share his heart. And that is meant to be us as his children. When these things are fulfilled, then we can experience joy. So it turns out that God also created the vessel through which for, our, for us to be able to find God and to experience such love. God created, the Bible says, God created Adam and Eve. And Adam and, Adam and Eve were created in his image. Adam and Eve were meant to go on to create a family where God could dwell. And through that family to teach us all about love. So the family has often been called the school of love. It is a place where we're meant to uh, learn about and experience God's love. Uh, Reverend Moon often talked about the four realms of heart, the four realms of love in a family that we first experience love as children. You know, again, receiving love from our parents. And then as we grow and develop, we begin to grow in our ability to extend ourselves and to love others with our brothers and sisters, with our peers, with those around us. And ultimately, we come to the point where we find our partner in life with whom that we can experience a, a deep, intimate love and a sexual love with that person. And that becomes the foundation then for the parental love that we then stand as parents loving our own children and sharing that love with them. Each one of those four uh, stages helps us to grow in our ability to love 
going from a state of self-centeredness to a state of unselfishness uh, or uh, self, uh, unselfish love, giving, living for the sake of others. So th the family that is teaching us is meant to uh, help us to grow along that path of love. So the family ultimately becomes the, thank you, thank you. The family ultimately becomes the foundation for God's ideal that he wanted to create in the world.